Man, it's good to be together. Thanks for coming out this morning to celebrate Jesus in the gospel. I love that last song that we sang. It really is about him. Praise and honor be to Jesus. He's the main focus. He's the main man. All glory to him. And uh, I just, it feels really good to be gathered with a bunch of people who believe that. Uh, you are not alone in your faith. If you want, you can just take a look around. You just look around at the people sitting around you. You're not alone in your faith. We're a family together. We're in this together. Um, and we got an amazing Father who has done so much for us. So uh, we are, this is the third week into um, our second Timothy series. We're going to be spending 15 weeks in this book. Uh, we're going to be ending chapter 1 today with those last verses. Would you please turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> Uh, verse 15, 16, 17, 18, those are the verses we're covering this morning. Uh, if you would, out of reverence and respect for God's word, would you stand with me as we read that passage? Second Timothy chapter 1, 15. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, among who are Philgelius and Hermogenius. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. God, would you help us to handle this scripture this morning with truth, to see what you have for us, that we could leave this place changed. God, we do not want to be a church that simply nods its head in agreement, and then the actions that we live out are different. I pray that you would keep continually closing that gap of sanctification to what we know to be true and what we live out in our everyday lives. In your name we pray. Amen. You may have a seat. There's a, a big difference between a belief that's based out of conviction and a belief that is based out of convenience. Conviction is a deep personal belief that is unwavering. Convenience is something that takes very little effort and very little difficulty. If you walk into a convenience store to buy a Snickers bar, it will be really convenient. For one, the store is gonna be right there next to where you're pumping your gas. Um, you'll just be able to walk across the parking lot to get into this store to buy your Snickers bar. Uh, there's gonna be beautiful music playing when you walk into the convenience store. They'll be met by friendly people who will gladly show you where the Snicker bars are at. There are, there'll be giant posters on the walls of people eating Snicker bars and smiling just in case you forgot how wonderful Snickers make your life. If all else fails and you somehow make it to the cash register without a Snickers bar, they have a whole box right there beside the cash register, and the cashier will literally ask you the question, is there anything else that you want Why they look at the Snickers bar? Um, if it's so convenient that even if you were not planning on getting a Snickers bar when entering the store, most likely you will walk away exiting with a Snickers bar. I know that from personal experience. That's a convenience store. Now, if you were going to walk into a conviction store to buy a Snickers bar, oh, would that be a very, very, very different experience. You would be met by two bodyguards they are going to ask you why in the world you want to buy a Snickers bar, and you have to give them the top ten reasons why. Then you will have to give a full account of every reason on why a Snickers bar not just makes your life better, but everyone else's life better as they watch you eat a Snickers bar. Before they let you in the door, they're going to make you do 10 to 20 push-ups and then be able to run a 5K in under 30 minutes. If you can do all that, the, the conviction store will then allow you at least inside the store. Once you get inside, it's going to look like the worst gas station bathroom you've ever been in. 
and it will smell horrible, and there'll be, and there'll be uh, smoke, nasty smoke smells and vomit smells and grossness everywhere you look. You'll be wondering every, every place you look, where did that, what happened here, and why does that spot look black, and why does this spot look brown, and what's going on over here? It'll be the nastiest thing you've ever seen. Um, the background music will be heavy metal screamo that'll be played at an ungodly volume, and the snicker bars will be nowhere in sight. Uh, you'll have to look in dark crevices, reaching your hand to the dark crevices to see if maybe a snicker bar is in that crevice. Once you find the actual bar and you make it all the way to the cashier, she's then going to pull out a book that's incredibly thick on all the things that a snicker bar does to damage the human body. After reading 200 some pages of this and you standing for hours listening to her slowly in a high pitched vo uh, voice, read all this to you, she's then going to ask you to pay $5,000 for that Snickers bar, and they only accept cash. If you walk out of that conviction store with a Snickers bar, let me tell you, you are deeply convicted. You need that Snickers bar. And that's the difference between convenience and conviction. My question for you this morning is, why did you put your faith in God? Why do you claim to be a Christian this morning? Is it out of conviction that you believe something is true? Or is it out of convenience because it just seemed like the right thing to do in that moment? This is a serious question that we all must consider as we think through the pressures that come against our faith. Is it really worth the inconvenience for what we believe? Paul's letter to Timothy, this is, remember, Paul's last letter before he dies. He is pleading with Timothy to have a strong conviction for the gospel in which he stands because he's picking up the sense that there are many people in Asia, which is the providence where, uh, where Ephesus church is planted. There are many people that are walking away from the faith, and he's worried about Timothy, and he's telling Timothy, listen, have a strong conviction. Be willing to suffer, to go through many ridiculously hard things for your faith. Paul knows that if Timothy's face, faith is simply out of a convenience that just seemed right at the time, then he is going to fall away. And Paul is urging him, hold tight. So in this passage that we have today, the four verses that we're covering today, Paul is going to give two examples of guys that were so inconvenienced that they became ashamed of what they believed and they walked away from the church. And then he's going to give one example of a guy who stood strong and had a deep conviction in what he believed and would not be wavered to turn away. And would not be persuaded to walk away. So let's look at verse 15. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Please keep your Bibles open there. We're going to be working through these four verses. So look at the first verse. It says, you are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me. There is an extremely big, uh, massive exodus of Christians in Asia. And again, Asia is a providence. It's now modern-day Turkey. But it, it was a providence where the church of Ephesus was at, where Timothy was, was a leader of, that Paul had put him in there to help a, a straying church turn back to uh, being the church that God desires. That's what First Timothy was about. Now the second letter to Timothy from Paul, he's saying, do you understand that these things I'm talking about, and by the way, that's all of chapter 1, which uh, myself, Kelsey, and Corey have preached through. Um, he said, do you understand all these things I'm talking about? They're not in theory. They're actually happening right now. In Asia, there are many, there are many people that are just walking away from the faith. They're abandoning Paul. They're abandoning his teachings. Why? Because Paul's in prison and the whole church is shook up. If that's what they're going to do to Paul and he's our leader... And he's the one who's been writing letter to, letters to us and, and getting this church up and going. Like if that's what they're doing to Paul, all of our lives are in danger. And so the church was having this mass, mass exodus because people were like, it's not worth staying together. It's not worth standing on out of a conviction of what we believe. It's just not worth. It's too inconvenient. It's too many troubles. There's too many chances that we might end up in jail. So they're, they're walking away. And Paul is suffering in prison and so disappointed about what he's hearing, he's pleading with Timothy, stay, stay strong, remain faithful. And then he gives the two examples. 
Well, let, remember, remember in chapter 1, I was the one who preached on this verse where he told Timothy, don't be ashamed of the Lord's testimony and also of my chains. He's going to keep talking about don't be ashamed of my chains because he understands as they make an example of Paul that they're going to try, their, their tactic is to freak everyone else in the church out so that the church disbands. He said, don't be scared of my chains. Then he gives the two examples of people who were scared of the chains and just walked away. It was too inconvenient to be a, to be a part of the church. The first guy he talks about is, and, and the latter part of verse 15 here, is Phagellus, and the other guy is Hermogenes. Now, these two men, there's no other mention of them in the Bible. You won't find them anywhere else. The only mention that we have of them is this verse, and it's of them walking away. I'm assuming that Paul uses these two guys as an example because Timothy knows them personally. Uh, we can, I think, safely assume these were very influential people in the church, if not leaders in the church. Otherwise, he wouldn't be mentioning their name as these examples. That Even these two guys, even these two guys that were so faithful at one point in time, were so helpful in the church, had majorly influenced church, in the church. Even these two guys, it's just too inconvenient for them to stand under the faith and to be associated with Paul that they're now walking away. They don't want the suffering. These guys are more concerned about self-preservation, about their reputation in the community than they are about the truth of the gospel. They wanted safety over truth. And so they became ashamed of what they believed and didn't want to be associated with the church. Didn't want to be associated with Paul. And so they walked away. And Paul is so disheartened about this. One of the most painful experiences when it comes to suffering for the gospel, which we're all called to do, one of the most painful experiences and realities that makes a Christian so depressed is when other Christians reject you and walk away when you need them the most because you're going through extreme suffering in order to stand up for the faith. It's easier to take it from the world we expect it. It's still hard, but we expect it. We expect non-Christians to not understand what we believe and where we're coming from and for there to be friction. But it is so hard. It's a new level of pain when the suffering is caused by those who should be on our team. They claim to be committed to Christ. They claim to be committed to faith. They've, they've sat beside you and stood beside you in worship times. And when you needed them the most through the most suffering and pain that you're going through, instead of joining you and standing with you, they walk away and want nothing to do with you. And that's what Paul is experiencing. And it's incredibly troubling to him. Look, as Christians, we become family. With your local church, we become family. That means we open up our hearts to a certain level of vulnerability for deep relationships to happen. We know there has to be a level of honesty and vulnerability as we share life with each other and walk with each other. We tell each other stuff that other people, the world wouldn't know as we share and, and live life together. And when you open up your heart to someone like that, you give them the ability to cause so much pain and hurt. That's why a lot of people walk away from the church saying, I want nothing to do with this. I got hurt so bad. Because church is one of the most beautiful places for a family to be formed and a community to come together with Christ as our Father, centered around the unity of the gospel. But when that trust is broken, it can be one of the most hurtful places to be involved in. But just remember something, church. What Paul is going through, and probably at times what you have gone through if you've been a Christian for a while, you know what it's like to be betrayed by another Christian that you're living life with, and they, when you're suffering and going through something, they just kind of distance themselves from you. Just remember something. Jesus experienced that same pain. He knows your suffering. He knows the pain. He knows what you're going through. Think about this. Can you imagine the pain that Jesus went through when Peter denied him? I got a picture of that for you there. I like this picture because it's showing Jesus looking at Peter. And the pain that must have felt in his heart as Peter the guy he had walked so close to and he had loved so well 
Peter, who was a messed up dude that Jesus kept giving chance after chance to walk with him in Jesus' most suffering moment. His flesh is literally being ripped off his body as he is being whipped and mocked. And while that is all happening, and he's in incredible anguish, one of his closest friends, he had three really close ones, Peter, James, and John, one of his closest friends that he did the most with than any other person, mission trips, traveled with, denied he even knew Jesus when the pressure was on. Three times. Not once, not just twice, but even a third time because he didn't want to experience the suffering and the embarrassment that Jesus was going through. So Jesus understands that pain that Paul is experiencing, and Jesus understands the pain that you have experienced when Christians have turned on you in your darkest and hardest moments in your suffering for what you believe is right. And then we, got, we can't forget about Judas. Then we got Judas and Jesus. A whole new level of betrayal. Judas literally took money. He got paid off to show the guards who Jesus was so they could put him to death. And he betrayed him with a kiss, which was a sign of closeness. I mean, it doesn't get much worse than that. Can you imagine the pain that Jesus felt? One of his 12, he invested so much in then, got paid off. Took 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. Jesus knows Paul's suffering here. Jesus knows our suffering. Jesus knows the pain of having someone who should be standing with you, should be right there for you, rejecting you, and denying you, and betraying you. So after Paul gives those two examples of, to Timothy about these two men who have walked away from the faith, have left Timothy stranded, have left Paul without support, He then gives an example of someone that Paul wants Timothy to follow. Onesiphorus is his name. So look at verse 16. It starts off with a prayer. He says, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. For he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. So Onesiphorus is a great example of what it means to be loyal. By the way, we're going to talk about this guy for a while. I, I, I have a hard time pronouncing big and weird names over and over and over again. So can we just call him Onesi? Are you guys okay with Onesi? Are you okay with that? I don't want to be disrespectful for this guy. He's a great man. He's done some amazing things. But uh, Onesi a little bit. comes out of my mouth just a little bit better than Onesiphorus. Uh, so... Paul prays a prayer of blessing over his house. Why does Paul pray a prayer of blessing over Onesi's house? It's because of this. He knows that anyone who partners with him, their household is in danger. And so he says, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesi. Paul is a very relational guy. He deeply values and is sincerely great for those who partner with him. Often his letters that he wrote to churches, you'll notice this in the very last chapter, he will point out by name individuals in that church that mean a lot to him, have partnered with him, and have added value to his life. And he'll thank them publicly in the letter. Uh, When we went through the book of Romans back, uh, we ended it in June of 2021. The last chapter of Romans, which is his longest letter, he lists over 33 names of individuals in that congregation that have partnered with him and he so appreciates. Even in uh, 2 Timothy here, when we get to chapter 4, he is going to again mention, say hello, greet the house of Onesi, because this family has meant so much to me. So let's look at what Paul says about Onesi, how he praises and compliments Onesi's behavior here uh, towards him. So if you look at verse 16, he says, For Onesi, he often refreshed me. So that's one reason why we need each other as Christians, because we need each other to refresh and encourage. Refresh is the idea that when it's really hot outside and you're exhausted and you're sweating and you just need a glass of water, someone comes to you with a beautiful, big, tall glass 
of ice water. And they hand it to you, and you drink it, and immediately you feel relief and refresh. That's what encouragement does when you're suffering and going through something really hard. Because when you suffer, you get weary, you get tired, you feel so overwhelmed. And when another Christian walks up to you and you're suffering for the gospel, doing what is right, being faithful to God, and they come and they encourage you. And they say, hey, you're doing a good job. I'm here for you. You keep up the good work. Here's some things that Jesus said to your suffering. Here's some scriptural reminders that help you stand strong. It's like a glass of cold water giving it to that person to refresh their weary soul. I've had so many people in this church refresh me in times of weariness and times when I got really anxious about hard things that had to do as a pastor. I remember, uh, this is probably, I don't know, maybe eight, nine years ago, uh, I was just distraught about a sermon I had to preach. I did not want to preach this sermon. I knew it was going to stir up things, and, and I was trying to figure out how do I preach this in a way that's honoring of people who disagree, but at the same time just preach the truth. And I was struggling, and there was this little old lady named Myra Gerber, and uh, a lot of you guys will remember Myra. Uh, she's passed on now. Um, but she uh, used to come in here and clean the water fountains and clean around the church. And she's, she'd walk around and she was a little firecracker, say things. And we would laugh and have a lot of fun together. But she said, why do you look so mad today? And I'm like, oh, I'm prepping a sermon and I got to preach it. And I just don't want to. Like this one's just going to stir up. And she's like, well, let me ask you a question. Did you get that sermon from the Bible? I was like, yeah. She's like, what are you sad about? Preach it. Just go and preach it. If it's in the Bible, you got to preach it. <laughs> And I was like, you know, you're right. You're right. This, is the Bible. this isn't my sermon. This is the Bible sermon. She's like, exactly. And it was super encouraging. She lifted my spirits. And I preached it with a lot more boldness and excitement because when I was weary and tired thinking about the, the content, she encouraged me and said, you got this. Preach it. I'm sure, you can, I'm sure you can tell your own stories of seasons that you've gone through that have been just deeply wearisome and discouraging. And then a Christian comes along and says, hey, you got this. You're all right. Here, I'm, I'm with you. You're not alone in this. I think what you're doing is right, and I'm going to stand with you. And the amount of refreshment and encouragement that brings to help you to stay strong. It's one of the main reasons why the church exists, to walk with each other. This is what Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says. Let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and even all the more as you see the day approaching. And obviously that day is the Lord's coming. So we know it's going to get more intense as the, the day approaches of the Lord's return. When you come to church here, spur each other up. Get, get each other excited. If you see a brother who's having a really hard day, if you see a sister who's having a really hard season of life, encourage them. It's a major role you play, and it makes a difference for the Christian who's trying to stand strong in what they believe. Paul also compliments Onesi for saying that he was not, and this is in verse 16 again, he was not ashamed of my chains. Again, he had mentioned, ashamed of my chains. That's what he constantly is asking Timothy not to be ashamed of. So Onesi was willing to not just be, a, to be ashamed, not to not, not be ashamed, but he was, he was willing to suffer for Paul. And that's how you know if you're not ashamed of something, if you're willing to take heat for it. See, the local church is a community. We're supposed to be a people bonded together in the gospel, standing with each other through the trials of faith. This is why Paul put it to the church in Corinth. He was working with the church in Corinth. And he wrote him a letter called 1 Corinthians. And this is what he said in the letter. He said, if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all, re all rejoice together. So that's 2 Corinthians 12, 26. But do you understand the significance of that? You're supposed to be so connected, so bonded together, that if one person in your church is suffering, everyone should feel it. Say, yeah, man, I see what you're going through. We're with you in this. That's how connected we should feel to each other. This is why we have D groups. We understand you can't feel that connected with a group of 550 people on a Sunday morning. But there's a group of people we want you committed to called a D group. And in this D group, there's a level of vulnerability, honesty, and sharing. It takes a while to build that up. Some groups are there. Some groups still have some more work to do to get there. But the idea is once you're there, 
that when somebody in your group suffers, you feel so connected with that group that you all are suffering with them. And when one person celebrates something, a birth, a baptism, a moment where God really came through for them, they saw God in a very clear way, everyone rejoices in that. Everyone celebrates. To be alone as a Christian is not the intent. That's why you're saved into a family. Now look what Onesi did. It's really interesting what he did. He didn't just verbally tell Paul, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm staying with you, write him a letter, say, I'm, I'm staying with you, Paul. Look what he actually did to show that he was not ashamed of Paul. When everyone else is walking away, when everyone else doesn't want to come to church anymore because they're like, eh, I don't know, man, I don't want to get what Paul's getting right now. Onesi actually picks up and he goes to Rome. Look at verse 17. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and he found me. This Onesi guy is amazing. Not only did he hear about Paul's suffering and refuse to walk away, he actually went to Rome. Now, Paul must have been in prison and hidden in a really secret place because he had to search for him earnestly, earnestly is what the, uh, what the text says. So he had to really do some hard investigation work to find out where they had hid Paul away and where they were keeping him in prison. But he did the work. Can you imagine the questions he would have had to ask people? Hey, where's Paul? And maybe ask guards, like, have you seen Paul? He's associating with, why do you want to see Paul? He's putting himself out there. He's connecting himself to Paul, which is putting his own life in danger, and he doesn't care because he wants to encourage Paul. He does whatever it takes. He earnestly finds him, shows up in prison with Paul, and he encourages him. By the way, kids, if you want to draw a picture for me this morning, that would be a great picture for you to draw. I love to see a picture of Paul. Onesi looking for Paul in prison, trying to find Paul in prison, looking for him. Or maybe you can draw a picture where they're talking together in prison. But that was quite the search that Onesi went through to find Paul. Paul wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus, um, and it's called Ephesians. And in chapter 4 of Ephesians, he talks about this eagerness to maintain unity in the spirit this is what he says he says i therefore a prisoner of the lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have been called and with all humility and gentleness with patience bearing one another in love eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace and this is exactly what Onesi is doing. He is so eager to be connected with Paul, to be unified in the gospel, to be there for a brother when he's suffering, that he is willing to earnestly travel to Rome, earnestly seek out Paul and find him. Paul again prays in verse 18. That's our last verse for this morning. Paul again then prays um, for Onesi, and he says, May the Lord grant him to find mercy from the Lord on that day again a prayer of blessing say man i hope when god get, when onesi stands before god on that day by the way that's judgment day that the lord just has nothing but so much mercy to give him for the way that onesi has lived his life paul is just blessing onesi saying thank you may god give you mercy on that day and then he goes and then he changes his his uh, conversation or his, his writing then to Timothy makes another side note for Timothy and says, you well know all the service he rendered at Ephesus. So reminding Timothy, Onesi has played a huge role in you, partnering with you at the church of Ephesus, helping you. You know, you've seen the way he's impacted the church. In other words, Timothy, this is who I want you to be like. This guy's making a difference. This guy's incredible. This guy is um, being a, a, a bright light for the kingdom of God. Timothy, be like Onesi. Follow his example. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of my chains. Be willing to suffer, even if it's extreme inconvenience to who you are. Please be willing to suffer. Have a strong conviction. So what about you this morning? you got three guys that you can use to look at your life with. 
Is your faith based out of convenience? Where if it became too inconvenient at that point in time, you would say it's not worth being a part of the church. It's not worth suffering for Christ. It's not worth this faith that I have. Is that what you're, are you based off of convenience or is your faith based off as a strong conviction because you believe in the work and the person of Jesus Christ? Hey guys, can we, can we cut the live stream for a little bit? I know, like, I, I, I'm so glad for the religious freedoms we have here in our country. I'm thankful for the guys who fought for it. But one thing that has done that's not been good, it has made a strand of Christianity called convenient Christianity, where it was just convenient to be a Christian. My parents are more proud of me if I go to church. Most of my friends are Christian. Um, it feels like, you know, just kind of the right thing to do to believe in a God. Most people in my community, I get more respect and more honor in my community by, being, by saying that I'm a Christian. And it's created a strain of convenient Christianity. And right now, that's being exposed. So Corey talked last week about how 63% of people in America claim still to be Christian, but then how 25% are, 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 are only 25% are, acting, are actually acting it out, where they're praying, they're gathering in church, and it's impacting their lives. What's that huge separation? That's just crazy that 63% claim with their mouth to be Christian, but only 25% are actually making lifestyle changes due to their faith. What's that indiscrepancy? It's convenient Christianity where it's just more convenient with your surroundings to claim you're a Christian and it has nothing to do with your life. And maybe the church isn't shrinking. I'm just posing a question. Maybe in America, when we keep saying the numbers are declining, maybe it's not actually declining. Maybe the church is actually growing. What's actually happening is the church is being exposed to those who claim to be a Christian but no longer can hold to it because it's not convenient anymore. Gender identity issues where the church has to stay, take a strong stance because of what we believe. Homosexuality where the church has to take a biblical strong stance of what we believe. Abortion where the church has to take a strong stance in what we believe. Those are all things that our culture is coming against biblical Christianity with. And suddenly for a lot of people it's really inconvenient to be a Christian. So maybe the church isn't declining, maybe the church is just being exposed, where there was a lot of people going to church, but never really had a conviction in the work and the person of Jesus Christ, which is the gospel. Maybe the church is actually growing right now, but we're going through a sifting process, a pruning process to show who the true church is. My encouragement to you, and the whole reason we're going through the book of 2 Timothy, is to remain 
faithful. And you need to do a deep look into your faith and say, do I believe this because my mom and dad told me it's true and it was just more convenient to believe it? Or do I believe this because I am sincerely convinced that Jesus is king and my savior and his message is the message the world needs more than any other message. Only time will tell whether your faith is a convenient faith or a strong conviction of faith in Jesus Christ. But we're going through 2 Timothy trying to help you build that strong conviction. So lean into this book. Join Paul in his strong conviction as he tries to persuade Timothy to stay strong, to remain faithful. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this book, that we would have strong conviction in our faith. We would not waver when pressure and the heat comes. But we would be so convicted and convinced we would go through whatever suffering, whatever pain is needed in order for us to be faithful to your cause. It's in your name we pray. Amen.